Good evening for another event of a long but very, very substantial day. And um, right now we will be discussing political and practical approaches to persecuting war crimes. Um, of course, um, law as such is never a purely a political construct unless you are a pure positivist, but that is even far more so true for international law. And that's why it's so important that we have an international panelist, a panel with panelists from different backgrounds, um, some of them very practical, some of them very strong in the political area and writing. And um, it'll be a pleasure to introduce them to you right now. To my right, to my very right, is um, Miss Marie-Louise Beck, a politician with a particular interest for foreign affairs, a focus on Eastern and Southeast Europe, well respected across parties, but no stranger to the contentious battlefield of ideas. She's held in high regard as a defender of human rights oriented foreign and security politics and has brought networks in politics and civil society a very strong and demonstrable engagement for Ukraine. Next to her sits um, Mr. David Schlafer, a senior advisor for war crimes and accountability in Ukraine in the Office for Global Criminal Justice at the US Department of State. He was previously the senior assistance coordinator at the US Embassy in Kiev and served as an acting DCM and team leader in Pole in Rzeszów during the past year. Next to Mr. Schleifer sits Ms. Jadwiga Rogozhan, a senior fellow at the Warsaw-based Center for Eastern Studies, or as, we, as we say in Poland, expert on the Russian domestic politics, social, religious, national and cultural issues, and um, very interested also in the matters of Ukraine during the last two years. And joining us live from Ukraine, um, Dr. Anton Korenevich. Um, thank you very much that you will join us this evening. Um, Anton Korinevich is an ambassador at large in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine. He's a Ukrainian lawyer specializing in public international law, international humanitarian and international criminal law. Um, and I will start a discussion with a question to you, Ms. Beck. Um, your background and also um, political history is a very interesting one. You've been with the Green Party right from the early beginnings, um, including when it first entered the German parliament in the Bundestag in 1983. And today we face a peculiar situation in Germany where the ministry, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Annalena Baerbock, is the one who's pushing the boundaries of what is possible in terms of, let's call it, pro-Ukrainian foreign policy. She's um, um, recently put forward the idea of a hybrid international court, which we will discuss in depth during this discussion. But um, maybe you could just disclose to us a little bit how come that a party which started as a radical pacifist party is the one who is today pushing the boundaries and actually it's all the other parties which are often blocking and very hesitating um, from your own perspective and as a Green member. Thank you. Thank you. The Green Party never was a radical pacifistic party. Uh, the Green Party was in parts pacifistic. We had a lot of religious people who by their ethical convincement thought never a war again, but we did have a strong wing of anti-capitalistic, anti-imperialistic, and thus anti-NATO people. We were a leftist party. So uh, I think we have to be just analytically uh, correct on that. Uh, we were also a human rights party, and I think this is what explains that the, the party, and especially now the fraction, which is a lot of very young uh, people, could shift so fast. Uh, if you take me as an example, yes, uh, when we were debating the, um, the Pershing II issue in Germany, I really was believe, I, I really believed that this 
never again is sufficient enough and the responsibility which we inherited from Nazi Germany. Now, uh, to make a long story short, when I started traveling to Bosnia, and I went in there the first time in June 93, sitting with the people in the basement and hearing the artillery over our heads, and them asking me, why, number one, don't you give us the possibility to protect ourselves? Because we had this arms embargo for regions uh, where there was a crisis, German basic of politics, which not only the Green Party, but all the others have been sticking to. Um, so they were denied the right to protect themselves. And then we said, okay, but we are sending you blue helmets. They are going to protect you. But they had a mandate which only went as far as them protecting themselves and not having the right to protect the civilians. So in the consequence, we left those people in Bosnia who were attacked by paramilitaries plus by the Serbian army. Um, we left them without shelter, without protection. I think the most unethical uh, uh, view you can take. And this changed totally my looking back at the responsibility. The responsibility is, yes, never a war again, but the bigger responsibility is to pre protect those who need to be protected or give them the chance to protect themselves, period. That's all that needs to be said uh, if we talk about Ukraine today. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And um, Ms. Jadwiga Rogoza, um, I would like to ask you to jump in and just give us a quick glimpse and overview of what the Polish perception is in terms of um, building um, international courts and persecuting um, war crimes. As we said here in Germany, it's actually still a pretty contentious issue. Uh, what's the situation in Poland? I would say that we are pretty unanimous on the issue, on the issue of accountability, and it involves uh, criminal and political and economic financial accountability of, of the perpetrator of aggressive country. Uh, and if there are any differences, they are absolutely minor. Even our uh, very right-wing parties, the marginal ones that used to be a little pro-Russian, and quite anti-Ukrainian. They keep very low profile right now and they help Ukraine uh, just because this is the, our vital existential interest. This is just an existential case for Poland just as it is for Ukraine. And that's why, and we also have thinking of, of accountability. We have our own account of, of wrongdoings with Russia, a very long one. Uh, and one of the many still unresolved is the Katyn massacre, the 1940 Katyn massacre that was subject to uh, proceedings in the European Court of, for Human Rights. But it was not really resolved. It was considered a war crime. Uh, by Russians, but uh, but actually uh, no uh, uh, perpetrators were named, uh, no uh, uh, reparations were paid out, and uh, uh, Russia was well actually got away with it as 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 many times before. That's why we think that this uh, uh, lack of ac accountability is a fatal mistake because if repeated it gives the perpetrator the sense of immunity, impunity. And uh, it encourages its successors that we can see today to, uh, to just do the same. And this is the root of what is going on today in Ukraine. Uh, whatever we have seen uh, in the 20th century as Poland, uh, and whatever we consider not uh, uh, put to justice. That's the, and that's Coming back to your questions, that's just uh, quite a consensus in Poland. A well, pretty cohesive picture in Poland. Um, Mr. Korinevich, um, my question to you would be like, we just mentioned this idea of a hybrid aggression court. 
Um, now, some think that this is a pretty pragmatic approach. Others point to its strong limitations. It would be a court consisting of Ukraine, um, uh, based on Ukrainian law and consisting of international um, um, uh, of um, international referees. And the problem would be, of course, that. Uh, most of the lawyers think that the Russian Prime Minister, President and Minister of Foreign Affairs would not be um, affected by it. What is your point of view on this? And I know you've done a lot of work into thinking about uh, what a proper aggression tribunal ought to look like. Um, what's your point of view on this and in general the Ukrainian perception? Good evening, uh, it's a big pleasure to be here today with you and to see a lot of uh, friends and colleagues uh, in the room, both in the panel and, and also, I'm sure, there as the audience. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I would say that all the variants, uh, when we talk about the establishment of the Special Tribunal for the Crime of Aggression against Ukraine, all the variants are on the table. They are all being discussed, they are all being analyzed in order to find the most feasible and most effective one. And I would say that, of course, it is very important that um, German Federal Minister Baerbock came up with the idea that there should be something established, some mechanism in order to cover the issue of accountability for the crime of aggression against Ukraine. I do think that this is a very important moment where we as international lawyers, understanding that international law does have some limitations, does have some current principles and, and basis on which it is based, but we cannot just close our eyes and not react to the things which happen. We need to try to find the solutions which will be legitimate, credible, and which would justify the need for justice and for accountability. Uh, so that is why the thing that this uh, discussion, this discourse is on the way, is a, is a positive step forward. We do consider this. So for us, for Ukraine, it is clear that the, the more the special tribunal will be international one, the better it will be, not only in relation to immunities, but of course immunities um, is a question which is an um, elephant in the room, uh, but also to the issues of legitimacy and credibility. So for us, the most international format of tribunal possible, whether on the basis of agreement with the United Nations, or, uh, and then endorsed uh, and supported by the resolution of the General Assembly, uh, or on the basis of a multilateral treaty, uh, would be, of course, a priority. But as I said, all the options are on the table, and we are discussing and analyzing them uh, with our partners and colleagues and friends. In relation to the hybrid format um, and the possible problematic questions which this format may bring, so you mentioned immunities, uh, this is obvious thing. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we need also to clarify whether a hybrid tribunal can go for the persons who enjoy functional immunity. You mentioned uh, people who, from Troika who enjoy immunity ratione persona, head of state, head of government and Ministry of foreign affairs. But we need also to see whether the hybrid format can work with those who are number four and down so that whether the persons who enjoy functional immunities uh, can be tried by the hybrid tribunal. Uh, the second issue, which is of concern for the hybrid option, is the issue that when we speak about the crime of aggression against Ukraine, with vast recognition of this act as aggression, in particular in the resolutions of the United Nations General Assembly, whether it will be a proper response from international law to have uh, judgments in the name of Ukraine, because it will be a Ukrainian court. So in such a case, when we have such a blatant and flagrant violation of international law. Uh, the third issue which is of concern is our internal issue, is the issue of uh, amendments to the legislation, and in particular to the constitution of Ukraine, which for sure um, will need to be done if this will be a hybrid format. Uh, because uh, there are several articles, in particular article, which says that uh, only nationals of Ukraine can be judges in the courts of Ukraine. Uh, and when we do have martial law now in action, we cannot make any uh, amendments to the Constitution. So these are just, um, I would say, the, the key issues which are on top of my head, of course, 
we can go deeper uh, to that analysis. But that is why uh, we are cautious with this format. But we are, as I said, open to discussion with our partners. And uh, we are really looking forward uh, to see which form, which model, and which option uh, will lead us to the establishment of a tribunal which will be feasible, effective, and which will do the job. Because we cannot uh, make a failure and create uh, something which will not deliver. We need something which can bring justice to Ukrainian citizens and can show to Ukrainian citizens that those who waged and still wage this um, aggressive war, that they are brought to justice. Thank you very much for this extensive comment. And um, Mr. Schleifer, um, first of all, um, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on what we just heard from Mr. Koronavich, i.e. this idea of a hybrid, um, um, hybrid court being a good first step, but one that warrants many amendments. And the other point would be is that, um, well, uh, I mean, there's an old stereotype, of, especially about continental Europe, saying that it's mostly all about theory and the prerequisites to the introduction, to the preliminary remarks, to the concept, whereas uh, you guys, um, at least in public perception, tend to be more hands-on. And um, I know that there's uh, indeed already works going on, on the ground in Ukraine, not only documenting war crimes, not only military assistance, what we throw from media, but indeed, if I understood correctly, preparations for uh, legal procedures later on. So hoping that you may stretch the boundaries of what you are allowed to tell us and disclose to us. Um, it would be very interesting to hear what you have to say on this. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, again, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers of the uh, conference uh, for inviting us to participate. Um, and again, my name is David Schlafer, um, and I am with the U.S. Department of State. Um, I'm in Washington, D.C. right now working in our Office of Global Criminal Justice. That is the office that works on war crimes and atrocities. Um, I work with Ambassador Beth Van Skok, who is our special envoy uh, for war crimes and accountability. Um, I'm not an international uh, criminal law expert, uh, just a regular diplomat, uh, but I have been in Ukraine uh, for the bulk of the past 18, 19 months. Um, I only returned a couple of months ago. Um, I was a part of uh, our diplomatic team that was in Ukraine during the crisis that evacuated our embassy first to Poland, operated on the Polish border. We are still there with the presence at the Polish border and then returned when our new ambassador uh, was de designated, Ambassador Brink, back to the embassy in Kiev uh, in June. Um, and what I can say is that from the very beginning, from the earliest days when we realized, even before the invasion, that this was about to happen, uh, in the earliest days when we were sitting in a hotel room working in our laptops in Jessup, having evacuated and left everything behind in Kyiv, when no one knew what was going to happen militarily, and we all feared that the worst case scenario in the early days, uh, the Russian offensive actually being successful and taking Kyiv, we all feared that was going to happen, even during that period, uh, in discussion after discussion, the issue of accountability, uh, the issue of not allowing uh, this uh, uh, crime uh, to uh, take place with impunity and for there to be no consequences, no ramifications for the perpetrators of this aggression of the war crimes and the atrocities that were taking place and are still taking place in Ukraine, that that was simply unacceptable. So we have been discussing internally and doing everything that we can do, the United States government, with a whole of government effort, uh, with our key partners and allies again for, at this point, a year, right? We're coming up on the anniversary very, very soon. 
Now, on the issue of uh, the crime of aggression and aggression tribunal, and some of the other things that we heard just in the last uh, presentation that we had, uh, the question of genocide and whether that is applicable as a legal concept to what is taking place in Ukraine, uh, whether the cultural genocide dynamic is applicable, um, the um, crimes against humanity uh, designation and the impact potentially uh, that that would have in various legal fora connected of course with the crime of aggression. Um, all of those are very significant and important issues. I'm asked about those three all the time and whether the United States supports all three. And my response is maybe, perhaps, let's wait and see. Uh, not because we're not generally supportive, obviously, of accountability, but because discussions are still taking place. Uh, and at this point, I don't think that we are ready to commit to any modalities, any specific type of vehicle or mechanism, let's say, uh, for an aggression tribunal or an aggression court. Um, as we've heard and as we know, there are different ideas out there, even diff you know, different types of hybrid. It's not just one hybrid solution, but there are different models and examples that are used. Um, I think that the United States is going to continue those discussions with the ambassador, uh, with our Ukrainian partners, uh, with our international partners, um, and hopefully come soon to a consensus on that issue, on some of the designation issues that I mentioned. Um, I can say that this are, there, there are some other ideas that haven't been mentioned yet here today, but that could be interim steps uh, toward the creation or formation of another vehicle. One of those is the idea of an interim prosecutor's office. This has been talked about extensively over the course of the last month or two. Uh, the United States is very interested in that and is engaged on discussions about that as well. So for crime of aggression, I will stop there and not get out in front of my skis, but it is something that we, are, uh, that we take very seriously and that we are very deeply involved in. Um, Patrick, quickly to your other question, um, I did want to talk a little bit about what the United States is doing as regards accountability for war crimes and atrocities on the ground in Ukraine right now. So kind of moving from the bigger picture aggression tribunal type dynamic uh, to what we're actually doing in the field with people in Ukraine uh, in support primarily of the office of the prosecutor general. Um, and, and we've been doing that again since the very early days. Um, the primary mechanism that the State Department uh, has right now and that we're engaged in is an initiative that is called the Atrocity Crimes Advisory Group. This is a multilateral initiative of the United States, the European Union, and the UK, uh, which basically aims to bring uh, the expeditious deployment of subject matter experts into Ukraine in order to work in the field, in Kyiv, with the Office of the Prosecutor General, in building cases, basically, uh, and in studies of case law, uh, with uh, prosecutorial personnel that are brought in, and also in mobile justice teams that would have more of uh, a, a field impact, working outside of Kyiv, working in areas where atrocities have taken place, potentially working if security conditions allow later in areas that are newly liberated, with the investigators that are there on the ground, both as regards forensics, uh, and how to collect and then use those subsequently in building cases, uh, and also in the collection of narratives, uh, first-hand narratives and stories, etc., uh, that individuals will have and families will have, etc., about their experiences, uh, which then can be collected uh, and kept, and this is another issue, uh, maybe for another panel, in a repository, uh, whatever that might be, um, in order to inform investigations and prosecutions at a later date. Um, to date, the United States has committed, I believe it is about $28 million uh, from our supplemental budget, budget appropriations uh, for the ACA, and I think that that is very likely to increase. It's very likely to uh, continue. 
Um, I also want to mention briefly, especially because I have a colleague uh, of mine in the audience from the Department of Justice, uh, that there are some major efforts underway, not just at the State Department, at our Foreign Ministry, but at our Justice Department, um, which just this last summer, also very quickly after the invasion, created its war crimes accountability team for Ukraine. Uh, and this team is investigating cases in which U.S. courts have jurisdiction. Uh, especially cases in which U.S. nationals are among the victims, and these can be dual nationals, obviously, both Ukrainian uh, and um, American uh, citizens. Um, and it has brought together the Justice Department's leading experts in investigations involving human rights abuses, war crimes and other atrocities. They're providing very wide-ranging assistance, including operational assistance, advice regarding criminal prosecutions, Again, evidence collection, forensics, narratives, and relevant legal analysis to Ukrainian authorities and others. The Justice Department also announced last year the creation of a separate task force called Klepto Capture, which deploys tools and authorities against efforts to evade or undermine economic sanctions uh, taken by the U.S. government in response to Russian military aggression. This task force has facilitated and prioritized the seizure of assets, which of course is linked to this overall issue of accountability, claims commissions, et cetera, uh, potentially somewhere down the line, uh, including yachts, super yachts of sanctioned individuals with close ties to the Russian regime, dismantle Russian criminal networks, and enforced sanction violations, among many other actions. Just a little bit of a snapshot of some of what the United States is trying to support in Ukraine. There are other initiatives uh, from other offices in the State Department and other parts of the U.S. government as well. Um, and again, we wanted to mention this in order to illustrate and demonstrate that from the very earliest days, we have been trying to think of whatever we could do practically and realistically in an expeditious fashion and in a quick fashion to help support Ukrainian efforts in this very important accountability effort. I'll stop there. Thank you, that was indeed very in-depth. And since Ms. Beck um, will have to leave us a little bit sooner, I will um, direct the next question to you and then to Ms. Uh, Rogoja. So maybe we could um, move um, <clears throat> the angle a little bit for a second to the political sphere. So you mentioned Bosnia and Yugoslavia. Now, a popular account or track record of what happened after the war, um, however we define the end of the war, is that on the one hand there was a relative success story named the ICTY, which operated back then because the ICC had not come into being. But the other problem is that it's also oftentimes referred to a lost peace. Uh, because of the Dayton Accords and certain institutional compromises which lead to Bosnia being a pretty dysfunctional state up until this day. And today um, my question to you would be, except like apart from the institutional solutions and uh, legal ones which um, Dr. Schleifer has um, just <coughs> um, uh, um, took a lens on, my question to you would be, how to get it politically right in a world where there is China, a very strong global player, and there is the so-called Global South, which appears to be, up to a large extent, pretty much buying into the NATO cost the crisis narrative. Thank you. I think if you look at Bosnia again, the fact that this country in ended up being um, so non-functional is uh, the consequence of mere political decisions. Uh, when finally, finally, there was an intervention way too late, I hope we won't see that in Ukraine, way too late, uh, politics waited until Srebrenica had to happen. I don't blame the United States, uh, we have been, I remember, traveling as a parliamentarian to the United States and urging you to intervene. And it was the Clinton administration which, which said, 
you guys, it's a European business. Why do us Americans always have to act? Go ahead, do it yourself. Clinton did not want to get his hands on it. I, th I think it's totally acceptable um, that they said, uh, <laughs> it's your business, Europe. Uh, we w have to talk about that again now, the way we behave, how, how um, reluctant especially Germany is, other than Poland, thanks heaven. So in the end, there was an intervention. It did not go to the end. It stopped after 10 days, right at the borders which Mr. Owen had proposed. Then there was a two weeks happening, I should say, uh, on an um, um, airfield. And we had a constitution which was supposed to be a preliminary uh, constitution. It gave the same amount of power to all ethnic groups, which they wanted to have before, and thus we have a dysfunctional state until today. Um, so this was a political decision, and I, I think it's worthwhile talking about that, because there has been ideas, and this is not a secret, that uh, Russia should not be humiliated on the ground of Ukraine, and this is especially German voices who come up with ideas like that. And the consequence, if you have this idea that Russia should not be humiliated, is that Ukraine should not win all the way and Russia should not lose all the way. And you know that our chancellor, with all respect, but I think until today, did not say Ukraine must win this war and Russia and Putin must lose this war. But this is very important, all the political preliminaries about the question of accountability. Uh, again, thinking about Bosnia is, is helpful because having come out with this uh, compromise uh, in Bosnia, which at that time was being thought was a good idea, would mean for Ukraine that part of Ukraine would stay Russian-occupied territory. And there has been more or less open talks about that. Uh, some say, oh, well, let's not talk about Crimea number one. Uh, others say, well, at least the borders of uh, the, the, when the 2014 occupation took, took part on the continent, maybe if Russia would withdraw behind those borders, it would be a good ground for negotiations. But what we need, and I think if we don't say that, there never will be accountability, is that Russia must withdraw from Ukraine territory, and this is the basis from which we are then talking about uh, accountability. Um, I think also this being reluctant on what to do uh, with then criminal ICC or special tri tribunals or any other way of accountability has something to do that, of course, everybody knows. If now there would be a statement that Putin and the responsibility people will be brought to court, you can't negotiate with them anymore. And in Bosnia, we had a different situation, which probably nobody has the fantasy to dream it about. It was Milosevic who was part of the negotiators. And only years after that, uh, there was a new government in uh, Belgrade which was willing to extradite him. So um, something which we can't imagine that Putin would part of negotiations on Ukraine and I would say on the European peace order, which we are talking about because you're right, it's because, because it's because of our interests, which in Germany is not so clear that it is about our interests. You Polish people and the Baltic people, they understood. In Germany, we have difficulties understanding 
and unfortunately our political leaders don't say it. They don't say it's about our interest. We talk about moral obligations, but not about our interest. Anyway, imagine that Mr. Putin and others will sit at a negotiating table and then bringing him to, to court later is something which you can't even think about. So this means that everybody who now speaks out in the same moment says, and with this guy there will be no negotiations. This is political touchy. You, you must know that. If you ask me, there should be no debate about that, accountability for the future of Europe and the civilized world must be, uh, there must be found ways for it. I think it was very interested, uh, interesting to listen to Professor Shah, help me with the name, Shabbat? Shabbas. Shabbas, because he really, as a very precise thinking legal expert, he told us don't mess around. And this brings me to your last question. We should not mess around in the sense of creating constructions which we have the power to do. For example, the United States, of course, have the political power for constraint and the EU, but which in the rest of the world will not be accepted. Because then we will have political courts. And, and this is very, very difficult, and this is why nobody has a real clear picture at the moment yet what legal basis this court will have. We have the problem and we know that not all countries of the world are upset about what obviously Russia is doing. Mr. Scholz is just in Brazil. Uh, the president of Brazil just told Mr. Scholz that he can't understand why we are criticizing Russia so much, we know about India, we know about China. So this is, I think, the biggest challenge. Accountability, but on a basis which not 10 years later will be used by others because then the international law is a political law and we should really see to it that we can stay away from that. And um, thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Rogoja. Um, we've been talking partly about um, <clears throat> like similar occurrences in the past or specific institutional solutions for the future. And of course, a question looming on the horizon in the background is what our actual aims are. I mean, when we think about um, post-war aggression tribunals or, or court processes, we think about Nuremberg and Tokyo, um, which were part, like, at least this oftentimes a narrative being told that they, they had not only a legal function, but they were, in fact, part of a long-term re-educational program, how awful it may sound. Um, the situation is way more ambivalent with Serbia. But my question to you would be like, uh, what do you think would be actually our realistic expectations that we could achieve? Uh, like, give it, let, let's say we agree on a specific model of a hybrid court or whatsoever, but do you think that by doing so, we actually have the capability to change Russia internally? As we know that the war, the, the war is not really just a Putinist war, it's, it's, it's Russian imperialism. one side reflection on uh, on this uh, issue mentioned historic issue uh, second world war uh, Nuremberg judged Germany but Russia called him itself uh, now it says it's it's been principal or even only victor of the war uh, whereas it was a perpetrator as well in 1939 Russia was a perpetrator as well uh, so it was never judged. It was uh, it privatized, monopolized the victory. Actually, it had the privilege to have its occupation zones after the war, and uh, and uh, so this justice uh, after the Second World War was, I think, was partial. Uh, what it when com what comes uh, uh, mm, to to Russia as 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 
repeating the experience of Germany or Japan, of course we know that uh, without occupation this is quite impossible. And if we look at the map, that's enough to, 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 to see how impossible that is. Uh, even occupying the European part of Russia, I mean, that's, no one talks seriously about projects like that. And the second thing is, I would like to stress here is that the system we have today in Russia it's been formed for centuries, not even decades. It's centuries. Because if we, looked, uh, if we look at the essence of, of, of political model, of model of management of, of Russia, it's ancient. I mean, this is a very vertical uh, model of management with very centralized power, personalized power, and with a society which was never a subject of political relations, never. And it isn't today. And uh, uh, this country, this state uh, was always, a, well, the state was a, a super value, not uh, human rights, living standards, uh, whatever, peace. The state was always a super value. The expansionist, uh, imperialist, militant state was always a super value. That hasn't changed. Uh, so, uh, and, and the society becomes kind of a, a mute, maybe victim, maybe hostage to that system, maybe just a participant or, or, or stakeholder of that system, but, but it is a part of that system. And re-educating uh, within like some kind of uh, foreseeable perspective, to me, it's, it's quite, uh, uh, quite a utopia. Uh, that's why I think we, if we think about uh, uh, our possibilities of, of durable uh, or, or uh, deeper um, ensuring of, of, of peace in, in, uh, in Europe. The peace should be secondary to, uh, to uh, battle, to victory, to, to, to battling uh, uh, the Russian essence. And uh, if we want to invest our potential, our resources, our energy, we should invest in Ukraine, I think. Because if we, if we are able to help Ukraine uh, like consistently and, and fundamentally transform into a European, a part of European legal sphere, not only sphere of values and social sphere, but also a, a legal framework, uh, become a, a member, a full-fledged member of not only EU, but also NATO. This will be our best investment in our own security, well-being, peace, of course, uh, and not trying to change Russia, which is quite a utopic project to me. I don't want, I don't want to leave this room <laughs> uh, uh, without uh, uh, talking, uh, making a, lo a, a short contradiction. Um, this very pessimistic view on Russia, I share it in parts, but there was, for example, the 90s. And we have been working with a lot of dissidents. And in the 90s, the Russian society started getting experience in freedom, in civil society, setting up a civil society. Uh, so um, the, we know that in a totalitarian system, it is very difficult if you ask people to get an answer. Uh, we have the Levada Institute left, and they, uh, they think that about 10 to 12 million, 10 percent, 15 percent of the people don't go along with the war of aggression which is now being uh, held by the country, that they don't support it, the possibilities of, uh, of going against it, well, ask a big to take, the willingness to, to take a big risk. I'm always very, very, um, I'm, yes, I'm a little afraid to have such a 100% forget this country view being German. I think in 1945, a seemingly civilized country which was able to commit and crimes what is unthinkable even in the Middle Ages has not been thinkable like that. We were being brought back into the civilization. We were given the chances and we developed pretty well. So 
Now you might argue, argue, but Germany had enlightenment and the story, history of Germany was different. But still being German in this case, I want to say, don't give up on a people totally. I think we shouldn't do that, also not in our interest. Very important for me to say that. Yeah. <coughs> yes, of course. Thank you for saying that. I, I hate to be a, a pessimist, but uh, uh, two remarks. Uh, first, Russians themselves have to judge their fate. I don't think any occupation, any re-education will work. Uh, I think that uh, the maybe collapse, maybe uh, bankruptcy of this model should convince them, but really sincerely convince them that uh, it's not in their interest either but uh, that should happen internally, that's one thing. Second is, I, I also remember the 90s, and I remember that after those free, free 90s, uh, with a lot of positive uh, you know, f energy of freedom going on, but also a lot of poverty and almost a failed state in many regions of Russia, uh, Russian people decided to recreate what they knew from the Soviet Union times, uh, what they uh, longed for, because they thought that the 90s were a decade of chaos on, and, and failure of Russia, that Russia was weak, that Russia was uh, pitiful and generally pathetic, and that the empire, the uh, державу обидна, as, as uh, General Lebet once said, that it's, it's like uh, you don't uh, do those things with uh, an empire. So what they did, in fact, how did the end, 90s end, unfortunately? They, uh, why Putin appeared? Not because uh, Yeltsin uh, selected him, selected, not elected, uh, but Yeltsin selected him because he, f he felt this social uh, uh, interest in having this type of leader. Uh, Yeltsin was seeking for a leader that would save uh, the <laughs> that would save the Russian uh, elite, and that leader had to be a strong hand, uh, sober, uh, young, uh, a male, and and uh, quite authoritarian. And KGB was sure with pleasure because I, I understand that this is this should be a discussion. Thank you very much for your input, but. Uh, this is a sad uh, end of the 90s to me, that uh, Putin was not a, just an accident or a mistake of the system. Putin was a logical reaction to the decade of, of, of Russia being weak. And uh, uh, the rest is just, uh, just the, the, the outcome of, 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 of social, uh, uh, social uh, interest. Uh, social uh, expectations uh, and that's why I'm talking about those uh, things being quite a norm for Russia not a, not a deviation the current war in Ukraine is not a deviation it's just a regular cyclic uh, norm that is that is uh, that is uh, likely to happen again if uh, if we repeat our policies <coughs> thank you um so um, we are running late a bit, which is on the one hand, of course, good news, as it is, um, yeah, basically this re reflects the passion and interest in this subject. On the other hand, I can see that Mr. Korinevich has is not with us anymore, and probably due to time related. Yes. Ah, okay. No, you so, just don't you. put me on the screen. No. Man, <laughs> it's fantastic to still have you here, Mr. Korinevich. Um, Right, so I have a question um, to you now. Um, <clears throat> so, basically from what we can read, like especially the, the EU position, um, the EU position is that it sort of supports for the time being a dual solution. Like, it has put forward the idea of a um, aggression tribunal, which we discussed before, but it's also all in favor of the actions of the ICC. Now, um, Ukraine, is, Ukraine and Russia, in fact, are not um, part of the statute of Rome, but Ukraine has issued two declarations um, accepting um, the actions of the ICC with regards to war crimes between November 2013, February 2014, and all war crimes from February 2014 upwards. Um, could you uh, just tell us a little bit more about uh, what the ICC is doing right now and um, 
with regards to the EU um, supporting both positions, it has been called by f uh, like several law experts as a benign form of helplessness, which nonetheless sends out a very important message that such war crimes ought to be never committed again. Um, what is your perspective on this, uh, Mr. Kornevich? Yes, thank you for your questions. Uh, I, I still have some minutes uh, to be with you. Uh, so in relation to the question of your position, um, I think that it is quite natural one. Um, I do not see any any issues which relate to um, negative reactions or assessments. But th the question is very simple, or the issue is very simple. Uh, there is a gap, there is a loophole uh, when we talk about accountability for the crime of aggression. And if the, IC if the European Union in its documents would support only ICC, it may lead to the idea that the gap for the crime of aggression, accountability will still remain. And I think that it is not the good uh, perception if we talk about uh, comprehensive or full accountability. So talking about this, I think that EU position is very logic that, of course, ICC is a primary institution of international criminal justice. We do have the same feeling and understanding, uh, but uh, ICC is not enough whenever we talk about comprehensive accountability because it cannot exercise jurisdiction over the crime of aggression against Ukraine. So that is why ICC shall be um, complemented, supplemented by the special mechanism, special tribunal. So um, we really see that EU position is very active. We are happy with that. We hope to continue this cooperation with the European Union colleagues. We are having Ukraine-EU summit on Friday, and tomorrow there will be meetings of EU commissioners with um, our members of government here in Kyiv. So two days of work in Kyiv. Uh, and we hope that in particular declaration of the summit will include some particular paragraphs on this matter. Uh, so the wording will be there. And also maybe some public statements, announcements will also come on. So uh, with the EU, we are moving forward and we are happy with the things we have now. Concerning the ICC, uh, we do actively cooperate with the ICC. And uh, I think ICC does have now everything uh, in order to deliver. Um, we have active cooperation with International Criminal Court on the level of prosecutors on the daily basis. The Ukrainian parliament has recently adopted national legislation, in particular amendments to the Criminal Procedural Code of Ukraine, uh, in order to make life uh, and, and the work of the ICC's prosecutors in Ukraine uh, easier. In particular, we have a separate chapter cooperation with the ICC now in the Criminal Procedural Code in Ukraine. Of Ukraine. So actually, um, we are awaiting for arrest warrants for Russian soldiers and other Russian nationals for committing war crimes and crimes against humanity. We do believe that ICC shall deliver, and we do believe that ICC does have everything it needs. And I also had some brief remarks on the issues which colleagues were, were speaking. I think they might be interesting for the audience. Uh, in relation to alleged genocide committed in Ukraine, since uh, Marie Louise and, and colleagues rose this question, I think that there are at least two elements, two instances, where genocide is very, very clear. And uh, the, the charges uh, on that elements, um, I'm sure, shall be deemed as genocide. First is public incitement to genocide, in particular in Russian state owned media like RIA Novosti. Uh, with that publications, what Russia needs to do with Ukraine, the coming of the Russia and the new era, where there are explicit uh, incitements to destroy Ukrainians as a nation. So public incitement, I'm sure, is there. So I think that, that prosecutorial authorities might work with this crime as a public incitement for genocide. And the other second element is the forced deportation of Ukrainian children to the Russian Federation. Because whenever we talk about genocide convention, whenever we talk about Article 6 of the Rome Statute or Article 444 of the Criminal Code of Ukraine, one of the elements of the crime of genocide is forced deportation of children from one group to another. I do believe that these two instances are rather clear for us to move with this genocide qualification. 
in relation to what uh, uh, Mr. Schleffer mentioned about the interim prosecutor's office, uh, I'm, I'm totally agreeing. Uh, agreeing. Uh, we do also see uh, in Kiev that interim prosecutor's office is something which needs to be established rather fast. It can be established rather quickly. And we believe that it is important to have coordinated investigation of the crime of aggression against Ukraine with international element, with international support, which will be legitimate and credible, and which will form the basis for the future tribunal, whatever format it takes, the investigation, which will be truthworthy, legitimate and credible, will already be there. So we do believe that the first steps should be the establishment of the interim prosecutor's office. And I hope that we will be able to hear some good news about this. And in relation to uh, the notion of Russian imperialism, uh, which, which was also brought here on the panel, I think that the special tribunal is actually the mechanism to, uh, I would say, bring Russian imperialism to accountability. Because never ever there was the in mechanism which brought Russian leadership to accountability for all the um, uh, hilarious and mass atrocity crimes. So maybe it is now time to do this with this Russian political and military leadership. And this would be also be the understanding that such conduct in, war, in the world as a whole, and in particular in Europe, uh, is not uh, possible. And that these uh, all uh, events will be analyzed and that uh, the justice uh, will be served. So I think that establishing of the special tribunal and ensuring accountability for the crime of aggression against Ukraine will also be a verdict, uh, if we may say so, uh, against the Russian imperialism, of which I'm sure current president and current leadership is a very bright image of. I thank you. Thank you. I hope you could hear the reaction, Mr. Korinavid. A lot of enthusiasm here in Berlin. Um, we, uh, of course, we always like. Yes. Yeah. Of course, we always like our audience not only to either think, agree, or disagree along, but also participate. So the Q and A session is approaching soon. But before that. Two more questions. The first one to you, Mr. Schleifer. Now, in your um, presentation, you mentioned a lot of the concrete steps and also aims of what the US is doing on the ground without getting into too detailed specifics since um, that is just not feasible for the time being. But my question to you would be, um, is this also part of the debate um, in the US or at the place where you work, if you are, of course, allowed to reveal, um, how to deal with the fact that this is, in, in, in fact, a very specific war. Like, for, for once, it has never been called as such. It's still a special military operation. Um, all the actions are taking place on Ukrainian territory. Um, and it's actually not even exactly clear what Russia is fighting against. I mean, it is clear, but it doesn't even recogni recognize something as ukraine so to speak. Um, and on top of that, if we think about the future, there are many, many legal dilemmas, like, for instance, what to do about the abstention rule and extradition. Um, this could be very difficult, given the geopolitical institutional landscape that we've been outlining here thus far. Um, is this also part of the discussion in the US? Yeah, I mean, those are great questions. I think everything that you said is part of the discussion uh, in Washington, uh, here in Berlin, and in capitals everywhere. Um, it's, you know, in some ways, it is an unprecedented situation. And others, like what you've spoken to, Yadviha, I mean, it's not. There's plenty of precedent, right? I think it is unprecedented in the sense that what Russia has done and what Vladimir Putin has done or has tried to do is to upend the international order, right? To destroy the post-war order, the post-war 1945 order, or the revision of that order which came in 1989 when the Soviet Union fell. 
you know, international rules and norms that I think all of us here in this room basically accepted at least as being applicable to certain parts of the world, right? Um, in some ways, they've already done that. And he has already achieved that in some measure because uh, perhaps it was naivete, but no one really saw this, you know, coming. Uh, even after 2014, I think that most individuals, whether they were diplomats or military analysts or whatever, would not have thought that this full-scale invasion was going to take place. So it is, in that sense, an unprecedented situation, and that may very well call for unprecedented measures. Now, it's so complicated. I thought that Dr. Shabazz's uh, presentation was great because he hit on just about every complication that there is, right? These incredibly complicated, you know, legal dynamics, uh, the uh, financial dynamic, and he used a great example, which comes up all the time, of what happened in Lebanon with the Lebanon court. Almost, it was almost a billion dollars, really, over uh, a half a billion dollars. Uh, corruption, graft, etc., uh, all for uh, a very limited, you know, outcome. There's a model that you don't want to follow uh, in many ways. Uh, so there is the funding and finance dynamic. There is the overall political dynamic. There is the dynamic on a resolution, on a ceasefire, on a peace. Uh, do actions that are taken by the international community contribute to that or do they make it more difficult? All of those questions have to be considered uh, in some way as we move forward. That's one of the reasons that I think that the talks that are taking place right now, uh, you know, it's taking a while uh, because there are so many different angles that need to be considered. When I think about accountability uh, for war crimes and atrocities in Ukraine and, and, and probably what steps the international community needs to take um, in order to make sure that there is not an impunity dynamic that nobody wants. I think there's absolute consensus across the board on that, except in Moscow. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always reminded, um, I had a philosophy class when I was in graduate school, um, and we talked about something that was called Perry's scheme, okay? It was about decision making, personal decision making, institutional decision making, political decision making. There were nine positions on Perry's scheme. And the first position was like a child, right? You're, you're id. You want what you want, you want you know, when you want it, and you don't really care about the ramifications. And, and it went all the way through to position nine, and position nine was ostensibly the most mature position or the magician, the, the position the policymaker uh, should take. And that was the recognition that in the face of ultimate uncertainty, decisions must be made that you're going to have to act, that you need to act sometimes, even when you cannot adequately account in your, your planning, your speculation, whatever, what all of the downstream ramifications are going to be. As far as accountability is concerned, I think there were three, these are very broad, somewhat vague, but I think they still make sense, three very broad areas that we should take into consideration and that whatever we do as an international community, um, and we should do it together as an international community, we should try to maximize the impact uh, on as many of these areas as possible and as deeply as possible. Um, one area would be the, let's say, the, the inherent or intrinsic value of justice of justice, of transitional justice, as a value in and of itself. Number two, you could say, would be the reparatory effect or impact uh, that these mechanisms or that the pursuit of transitional justice can lead to. And the third is more political, and I think that would be the deterrent value of actions that are taken both in terms of the deterrent value to the current conflict and the larger deterrent value, you know, going forward in the future for the international community, for the global community as a whole. So if you think about decisions that we have to make, perhaps, and think in terms of some type of a loose matrix of those three areas, and is what we're talking about is what we're deciding maximizing impact across those three and not being a negative 
uh, or a significant negative for any of those three, that might be in some way a useful mechanism, intellectual mechanism, policy mechanism, uh, decisional or deliberative mecha mechanism to help determine policy. Um, so, Ms. Rogoja, my last question before we move into Q&A to you would be, um, so the crux of the disagreement between you and Ms. Beck, I think, was the uh, question whether internal long-term change in Russia is possible, uh, um, in particular due to our actions. You seem to be more of a skeptic on this. Um, but my question to you would be, um, so what other means may we use, even outside of international law institutions, to um, follow the aims which uh, Mr. Schlafer was just outlining in his summary? I really like this summary because it also gives way to uh, a lot of practical approaches. Because what does it mean? It means that we should not be tempted to, to return to the status quo ante or business as usual or whatever we call it, to the world where, which was uh, uh, developing uh, on uh, cheap uh, uh, supplies of, of oil and gas from a partner that seems reputable, reasonable, uh, negotiable, reliable. Uh, there's no more of that. That's, that ended. And I think we should accept that as, as a fact. Uh, second is that sh we should not be uh, let ourselves be threatened by Russian threats. Because, you know, there's so many uh, mm, motives of Russian propaganda that we are easily uh, eagerly buying. Uh, one of them is that the collapse of Soviet Union was a, such a geopolitical tragedy. It wasn't. Well, it's always a shock, a tragedy for some people, but uh, uh, it's, it's such a, such a powerful trait of Russian propaganda that seems a fact, but is not. Uh, for many uh, nations uh, inside Soviet Union, for many nations outside Soviet Union, it's a, it was a bless. Uh, anyway, we, we hear a lot of threats with using nuclear weapons, with freezing Europe to death, everything, all sorts of, 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 uh, of, uh, uh, of propaganda. And let us think with uh, our own analysis, our own interests, our own uh, perspective in future, and not the Russian ones. And um, I think that we have made so many decisions that seemed unthinkable over the past year, and still a lot of decisions like that uh, are ahead of us. But I think, uh, I think absolutely we should uh, just go for it. So, you know, my, my, uh, my uh, answer to your question is that we should go for something that was unthinkable for us before, Ukraine in the EU and NATO. Because Ukraine proved that it has a, it can fight to death for, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, stability zone for freedom for uh, for for uh, peace it can be such an effective fighter uh, for 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 all these uh, values that we use verbally uh, ukraine proved that it has a huge potential of development really and its human capital is is remarkable it's it's indeed a european country that was uh, uh, a part of soviet union was to, to some some part corrupt by by uh, Soviet practices, but it really is a European state, and, and this is one of the unthinkable things to do in our own best interest, is to help Ukraine become a member, uh, uh, and and assist through all these complicated processes, also including these complicated legal and formal processes of. Of, of accession process. And I know that Poland is already doing that uh, for Ukrainian officials, state representatives, uh, uh, assisting with uh, uh, sharing the know-how and the, with all the legal formalities. Uh, but um, also, you know, rebuilding Ukraine, because that is also uh, on the agenda. 
rebuilding will not only be the reconstructing the Soviet, old Soviet infrastructure, it will be, as, as uh, this, uh, uh, this saying uh, uh, says, uh, uh, build back better. It will be modernization. So uh, modernization is also creating another area of modernized, vital, uh, 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 space uh, in our neighborhood is in our best interest. So, so, but so that we can create this space, we have to win this war together. That's a strong final statement. And um, again, we are running late, but we would still like to take a few questions. Uh, maybe I start with the left. Thank, thank you very much. My name is Samad. I used to work with the German parliament and I would like to contradict a little bit what Marie-Louise Beck said. The U.S. was very involved in the Balkans uh, with Richard Holbrook and Madeleine Albright. They did a lot with the Dayton Agreement. So I don't agree that the Clinton administration was trying to step out and see it as a European business. I think because of the Americans it was possible to to win the war in, in Kosovo and to bring justice to Milosevic and Mladic and uh, Karacic. But I have a question to you, David. Um, the German governmental officials are very, very delighted and happy in their work currently with the Biden administration. But you know that from 2016 to 2020, there was another American president I forgot his name anyway, but um, how would you see the possibility that this president will be re-elected in 2024? We have elections next year in the United States. Do you see a change of the policy of the U.S. towards Ukraine and, the, and, and Russia if this president from 2016 to 2020 will be re-elected? Thank Thanks. Great question. Um, I'm not going to speculate on who might be president in 2024, since I really like my job and I'd like to keep it. <laughs> but what, what I can say, and I think to get at the point that you're making, um, is that, um, you know, obviously the longer that time goes on, I think in the United States and in Germany and in the UK and everywhere, um, national, you know, populations uh, start to look more and more carefully at the assistance dynamic, right? Of course. And we're all having bad economic times right now with inflation. We don't know what's going to happen. You know, maybe there is going to be a recession and, and a global recession later this year or in 2024. That's a possibility. Um, and, and that makes voices that are concerned about oversight and accountability, fiscal issues, not war crimes accountability, but fiscal accountability. It makes those voices you know, very, very loud and it will amplify them. For the United States, I think what you can say though, and I think the best thing to look at is, we actually just did have an election right now, right? It was a legislative election uh, just a couple of months ago. There was a change of the ruling party uh, in Congress. The Republican Party uh, is now in charge of the House of Representatives. Democrats retain control of the Senate, but I mean, it's pretty close, right? It's almost 50-50 split. Um, despite that election and despite leadership changes and all the rest of it, there is no change uh, in U.S. policy. There is no change in the bipartisan support that continued large-scale assistance to Ukraine has uh, in Congress, in the Senate. Uh, almost every single day there is a new announcement uh, or announcement of intent by the administration, by the Hill, by the House, by the Senate about different types of uh, assistance. Uh, that is being delivered or is being contemplated humanitarian assistance, security assistance on a very, very large scale. Everyone is following what's going on with the debate over Abrams tanks and, you know, those commitments that were made, etc. Nothing changed during the election, nothing changed with the new leadership in Congress, uh, and nothing has changed in the United States posture of support and assistance for Ukraine to help Ukraine do what it needs to do, uh, which is to win this war and win this conflict, and then we want to work with Ukraine to win the peace and win the recovery. So I think that is the best metric that we can look at right now on this you know, fatigue issue or resolve issue or whatever down the line that we might want to call it. 
Right. Who else? Uh, my question was very similar, but more specific. So I just want to ask you, with your experience in the Ukraine for several months and in Washington, and the ideas you presented, are they depending on who is sitting behind the desk in the Oval Office? You, you answered very general now with, the, with these elections, but uh, there are another elections in two years, and uh, it's a long time thing. And uh, well, this is my question, what you personally think. Yes, yeah, just will not, not let me off the hook about that. But 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 I have to just you know restate uh, uh, what I stated previously. Um, I, I can't, and I think it would be irresponsible to speculate uh, about what could happen two years, four years, six years, or whatever with different individuals. But what we have right now, and what we certainly expect to have in the future, is very bipartisan, broad bipartisan support in the United States for support, supporting Ukraine writ large, especially on this issue of accountability uh, for atrocity and for war crimes. Uh, you know, there could be debate about the size of, you know, assistance packages on security assistance or humanitarian assistance when we're talking tens of billions of dollars and where you calibrate that or recalibrate that at some point. But for what we're talking about here today, I honestly cannot imagine uh, that there would be, you know, any political leaders in the United States uh, that would not want to see uh, perpetrators of war crimes and atrocities in Ukraine or any place else uh, not brought to account for their actions. Um, hello, my name is Mateusz Werner, Pilecki Institute. Again, uh, one more question to Mr. Schleffer. What is your opinion on uh, possible uh, reparations for Ukraine? Because someone has to pay for all the destruction which has been uh, committed, done to infrastructure, to cultural heritage. We know that um, there are more than 500 uh, million, uh, mil uh, sorry, one, uh, 500 billion dollars of uh, Russian assets frozen internationally in banks. So do you think it is feasible to, to use this money? Yeah, another great question. I think it's a very similar question to the crime of aggression tribunal question and that it's so incredibly complicated in a legal sense, in a practical sense, in a political sense. Um, it does have ramifications for any talks that might take place um, and I think that there are a lot of different opinions again about you know modalities we use that word a lot uh, mechanisms that might or might not be used uh, so there's discussion on that in Washington and in other capitals um, I don't think that there is any consensus on what the right court of action is. Um, I think, however, you know, we mentioned an interim prosecutor's office. We probably need to call it something different, but, you know, basically an IPO is a real possibility that people seem to be coalescing right now around that idea. So on sanctions and reparations and asset seizure and forfeiture and the use of these type of proceeds in some kind of reparative way, um, I think that, that one idea uh, that many people are supporting and are behind right now is um, at the very least an initial step that would have to be taken, which is this claims registry, right? It's not a full-blown claims commission, but a registry. I think I'm right in saying that there was a General Assembly resolution supporting that or calling for that. It's not my area, but I believe that was in November or December, right before I went to Poland, if I recall correctly. So again, that is one of these necessary but insufficient conditions for looking at a commission and addressing the issue that you're getting at. Um, and I know that the United States supported that um, and tried to whip votes, as we say, uh, at the General Assembly in order to, you know, have it uh, pass with as, as large a margin as possible. Um, and I think that all of our key, you know, European partners uh, and allies were very much behind that as well. So I think that's where that issue stands right now. But the complexity is such 
uh, and you have the question of, you know, what are realistic steps as opposed to performative or political steps, and, and, and all of that is so complicated, I think it's still very much a work in progress, let's say. Um, thank you very much. Um, we'd like to take more questions, but as we said before, uh, we've been running late. Um, I would like to thank all of our panelists. Uh, Ms. Rogoza, <laughs> Mr. Schleifer, the now absent uh, Ms. Beck, and a special thanks goes out to our special guests who joined us live from Kyiv. Um, are you still there with us? Um, I think in the name of the, 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 all the panelists and the audience, there's just one proper way to end this debate. Slava Ukraine! <laughs>